my esteemed grandmother attended the Oberammergau Passion Play in 1890. And during the crucifixion scene, a violent thunderstorm broke over the mountains and uh, became almost symbolic of the significance of the occasion. When I attended the play in 1970, during the crucifixion scene, a violent storm broke over the mountain. And according to the tradition of the area, this has been the usual circumstance for over 200 years. This uh, thought, perhaps, is appropriate to the significance of this day, in which a symbol of human regeneration, redemption, and the restoration of integrities is very strong in our minds, and we feel the call and dedication of the destiny of the common good. In these days of extraordinary transition, humanity at a crossroads, perhaps the most significant in the history of our race, humanity feels the call of spiritual urgency, the need to depend not upon the vicissitudes of policy, but upon the principles upon which life is founded. This morning, therefore, we want to devote a little time and thought to the problem of the individual facing and involved in the contemporary emergency. While we are all a little unhappy, at least superficially, over the confusion of our time, we also realize that it is a challenge that we must all meet, and that change can be and usually is for the best. We resent change because we settle back in accustomed ways and paths. We like to go on doing things as we always have done them. We like to sit on the side of the swimming pool. We like to drive expensive cars. We like to think of the joy of living. But these are of the moment, and to be real must be earned. But in the moments of confusion, we begin to weigh and consider the basic values of human purpose. Today, we are in the midst not only of national but world confusion. Everywhere, the policies by which we have formerly functioned are proving inadequate. The way in which we started our modern way of life has been plagued with difficulties since the beginning. And we should realize that where these crises arise, there is something wrong with the way we are doing things, that we are contrary to the laws of nature and the will of the divine creating power. We have not yet learned that we were created to obey. We have not understood the fact that our happiness and our security results not from our rugged individualism, but from our inward dedications. Therefore, on Easter especially, it seems appropriate to explore this problem of dedications and how we are individually and collectively to prepare for the changes that are taking place. The first point, I think, of importance is to realize that from the beginning we have always had to adjust to change. The history of humanity is the history of continuous change. It is the history of emergencies arising, solutions appearing, and the conditions subsiding for a little while into a so-called normal pattern. This normalcy is abused, perverted, misused, 
and another crisis comes upon us. Crises are not the work of some evil force. They are the proof of the presence of principles at the root of life. Our whole creation is suspended from law, and this law, as divine law, is the greater good. No matter what we accomplish, we accomplish nothing if we try to attain it through disobedience to the divine plan in which we live and move and have our being. Gradually, man must come to recognize that while he has a certain power of choice, he does not have free will. He cannot do anything that he pleases. He can only do that which is proper. And when he tries to disobey, nature does not punish him by personal chastisement. Nature simply causes his projects to go awry. That which is not according to the laws of life cannot succeed. We are all concerned today with the decadence of our moral and ethical structures. We realize that we have gradually drifted into a rather dangerous materialism. Among those who have drifted into materialism, there are many religious people who do not realize that their conduct is inconsistent with their faith. They assume that it is their right and privilege to drift along in the prosperity mechanisms that have prevailed for some time. Religious people must realize and recognize that faith must be lived and must be applied to all problems on all levels of society. It is useless for us to pray to God if at the same time we break his rules. It is useless for us to look forward to better times unless we deserve these better times. And this deserving lies within our own capacity. We have the right to choose to move with truth or to neglect that movement. And if this neglect occurs, our difficulties immediately multiply. We live on a comparatively small planet. And the more we explore the galaxy, the more we realize the smallness of our own human habitation. We are but a speck in a vast galaxy. We are a tiny molehill in, in, in eternity. Therefore, we are subject to rules concerning the use of the facilities and natural resources of our planet. We have the right to cultivate these resources intelligently. We also have the power to allow the planet to go to seed, for weeds to come up, and for the good harvest to be destroyed by neglect or indifference. What is the potential of our planet? We know that it is like a little ball, but it is also like a chemical vessel. It is a kind of jar or urn or vase containing within it everything upon which we depend for our existence. But the supplies of all things are limited. We have failed to measure uh, the use of our opportunities and privileges by comparison to what is available to us. We are now in a great program of trying to increase petroleum production. But no matter how much of an increase we achieve, it is only temporary. It is not the discovery of more oil that is going to solve our problem. It is the recognition of the right use of these resources how they should be conserved, how should they should be distributed among human beings in a manner suitable to the greater good of the greater number. We also have many other problems, pollution, 
overcrowding. We are in a condition in which the earth, in order to sustain us, must be better understood. We also realize that whether we like it or not, the age of extravagance is coming to an end. We can no longer do as we please. We have to ration our own desires. We have to live within our means. And this does not mean that necessarily our physical incomes. We must live within the means of the resources of the planet on which we live. Now this planet, according to scriptures, was intended to be a garden. And we were to be guardians of this garden. We were to keep it. We were to take care of it. We were to use its productions wisely. We were to sow and to reap within a policy of common sense and integrity. Not only are we in danger of exhausting of our resources, we are in danger of the pollution of that which remains. It is not possible to solve this problem by means of political means. It is not possible for us by any system of a materialistic nature to control the extravagances of the human mind. We have been, we have been gradually building a kind of illusion in space we have come to the false conclusion that we were created to have anything we wanted. And we were also privileged to get hold of anything we could reach out and grasp. We were also entitled in a certain general way to take from each other in order to gratify ourselves. All this is not only bad economics and bad policy, but it is bad philosophy and worse than bad religion. So today we are confronted with the concept of a resurrection, a resurrection of principles from imprisonment in policies, the resurrection of ideals from bondage to materiality. The final success of man must arise from the recognition that he is under a benevolent despotism of time and space, that there are only things that, certain things that he can do. There are things he must do as immediately as possible if he is to protect and preserve a way of life which is proper and reasonable with the commodities that we possess. Recently we have advanced another step in the scientific exploration of space. We are reaching out to find out more about the worlds around us. And we are interpreting these discoveries in various terms. One may think of this discovery as a step towards scientific healing, medicines, and uh, social orientation. We may think of it as a search for new basic resources. We may think of it in terms of communication or even of transportation. But into it comes the unpleasant thought that we may also use it for the perpetuation of armament and military expansions. These conflicts of purposes, these inconsistencies of dedications are, are continuing to plague us and may for some time to come be extremely troublesome. But whatever happens, the human being must remain here for his appointed span. And we are bringing into the world new generations of young people who must, to a measure, carry the responsibility and burden of our mistakes. We are also concerned about the future of the young. We realize that we must turn over to them the power of leadership. And it, uh, it is important that they be trained to be wiser than we were, that they shall be trained to keep the rules that we have broken, to restore the integrities which we have disregarded. 
and to recognize the sovereignty of a plan which, if obeyed, will give us peace and security, and if disobeyed relentlessly, will lead to chaos. The important thing, I think, is to follow the suggestion of one uh, rather interesting scholar. He said, if each individual will correct his own faults, there'll be one less rascal in the world. We must continue to build a reservoir of integrated people. We must bestow greater attention upon the development of those reflective powers by which we can choose to build a proper life. Between the, pr the primitive, who kept rules because he knew nothing else, and the ultimate of things, that golden age we seek, between these two is confusion. Because actually, in the end, the blind faith that led our ancestors will open its eyes and become the enlightened faith, the faith that must guide us. How are we going to go about this preparation? I think, first of all, we should be grateful that we live at this time. Many people would love to be somewhere else, and as conditions become more difficult, the tendency to rebel, the tendency toward violence increases. But neither rebellion nor violence can solve our problem. The problem lies much deeper. The problem lies in the need of the restoration of a kind of essential learning by means of which we can be qualified to meet emergencies. It is really most inspiring to recognize that throughout the world today, thoughtful persons are increasing in number. More and more, the mistakes are becoming obvious. And very seldom is a mistake corrected unless its consequences become unendurable. We will not change till we have to. And the greatest good is when change is brought upon us if that change is constructive and enlightened. We have depended too heavily upon physical progress. We have depended too heavily upon scientific materialism and industrialism. We have placed too much confidence in the power of the dollar to bring peace of heart or mind. We have also wasted our substances on a kind of riotous living uh, which brings no good to anyone concerned. In a few years, most of us will depart from this stage. We will no longer have our exits and our entrances. We will leave to others the unfinished business of growing up. And this process invites us to do all that is possible to equip this new generation uh, to the responsibilities of leadership. Thus, by our own example, by all our own repentances, we may bring about major changes in the characters who are to follow after. We are also, however, inclined at this time to lack the, co the courage or morale to handle a situation which is considerably confused. If in our own hearts, however, we recognize realities, we have the privilege of applying them to our own conduct. Actually, no one can reform another person. We may coax them, persuade them, we may violently assert a determination to change them. But the only person whom we can change with confidence and certainty is ourselves. To do this, each of us in his own way has spent much time contemplating the problems of living. We have sought as best we could uh, to solve the problems that have confronted us. We have developed patience. We have tried to develop a certain humility and understanding. We have sought to reconcile the differences of beliefs and doctrines. 
we really want to be a cooperative world. We want to live in a civilization and in a culture that is appropriate to our needs. Confucius, who was one of the first great socialists of history, pointed out very clearly that the family is the microcosm or miniature of the world. The family is the basic institution upon which all other institutions must be built. The failure of the family must inevitably lead to the failure of the empire. The failure of the home to become a symbol of the universal divine purpose is to build or try to build thereon a house upon quicksand. It is absolutely necessary, therefore, for us to begin with a certain knowledge of social sciences. It is necessary that we also attempt to arbitrate the confusion in our own immediate environment. I heard many people talk about the need for a union of religions. And at the same time, in families, the tendency to renew or unite religions does not seem to be operating very successfully. While there is conflict, discord, uh, misunderstanding, and aggression within families, the state can never be rectified. Therefore, we begin our life here at the cradle. We begin here by needing and requiring a basic pattern of life. As Comenius, the founder of our public school system, pointed out, that actually our learning begins before our education starts. The average person is not as flexible or is easily influenced toward self-improvement after he is ten years old as he is before that time. Improvement also must be inspired by example. We cannot have a gentle, kindly, loving child produced out of a conflict of family feuding and miseries. We have to try to find a way to create a way of learning that is to be the bridge between the present state and the future that we all hope will come to pass. This learning requires not necessarily a grand reformation of our educational system. It is not to tear it down that will solve the problem. All forms in order to function in nature must be ensouled by a principle of life. What we need is the ensoulment of our institutions. We need to have a spirit within them. We cannot live successfully in a civilization of zombies in which all creatures live in a kind of a miasma of uh, non-integrated purposes. So the beginning of our problem is in every walk of life, not to tear down, not to destroy, but to ensoul. By ensouling we mean that that part of the divine power which is, in, which is inborn and indwelling in us shall be given an opportunity to lead us in the direction we need to go. In the ancient mystery system, what we call the messianic principle was the soul of God made flesh. It was the soul redeeming the mind and the body. It was the soul guiding us uh, toward the final relationship between all human beings, and that is the relationship of love. Until learning is ensouled by love and inspired by faith, our problems will not be solved in this world. So we have many wonderful and skillful things that require ensouling. Politics must be ensouled by principles. The, the purpose of policy is to secure the rights, privileges, and necessities 
of all living things. The true ensoulment of policy means, therefore, a policy based upon an ideal of love, fraternity, and fellowship. Policy must be honest because the soul is honest. And when the soul is not permitted to express its honesty, it is blocked as within a prison and the individual's integrities are decimated. Also, we must ensoul the sciences. Astronomy is on the verge of important knowledge, but until the soul takes precedence over the mind, science will still wander in a strange, dark confusion of misuses and abuses. The legal profession is a great and noble institution, a wonderful body waiting to be ensouled. And until it is ensouled, there will be no justice in the world. Our religions are a great organism. Most of the religions of the world have had a glimpse of the mystery of soul. They have come to realize something of the spiritual power behind life. Religions, therefore, have already, in most instances, opened in part the door that leads to soul realization. But religions are still divided because they have not recognized that the soul is one and that all structures of a kind are ensouled by the same principle. All religions must be ensouled by the love of God and by God's love for them. And when this occurs, a unity of faith is inevitable. But while religions remain competitive, they are guided by self-centeredness of the mind and not the true centeredness, centeredness of faith and truth. We have other institutions, our industries, which have gradually become a great vehicle for profit. We have forgotten of the fact that the key words of industry are ich dien, I serve. The purpose of industry is to serve humanity, to provide what is necessary, to make possible the distribution of that which is available so that hunger, famine, and these problems and plagues and di disasters will not affect mankind. Our entire system, so-called of capitalism, is a structure which has become gradually necessary to meet the congestions and conf conflicts of living. But this system of wealth must be ensouled to the degree and in the way that it is realized that wealth is not based upon bank accounts, but based upon the right use of all that we possess under any and all conditions. In other words, again, our systems are servants of our needs, and when they become despotic, they become a cause of disaster and sorrow. All of our lands and properties must also be recognized for what they are. We are living on the surface of the body of God. We are living in a nature or in a physical environment created by great wisdom, by a wisdom far beyond ours. The use of this environment, the protection of its necessities, the, the willingness to share it, uh, to recognize a communal existence. Buddha said that the, that the space system, the great galaxy system, is a cosmic communalism in which all things laboring together can accomplish good. But when anything departs from the common need, it destroys its own utility. We know that toxic wastes, we know that the pollution of rivers and streams and of lakes all these are problems of great concern. We also realize that only by very careful thinking, very enlightened dedication, and by very skillful management can we prevent these disasters from increasing. 
Now it is evident to a great many people, and it's a cause of grave concern to most of them, that the present course is not being altered in a major way. The uh, world of learning is clinging desperately to materialism. It is determined to prove that material institutions can heal, remedy, or correct spiritual problems. But this, unfortunately, is not true. Almost all material learning is on a level. It is a motion forward or backward, forward in progress, backward in depression and scarcity. But the great plane of evolution is tilted upward. It is not on a level. Evolution is not a motion forward alone. It is a motion forward and upward at the same time. And this upwardness is not merely the conquest of space. This upwardness is moral improvement. It is the individual becoming wiser in true values as he becomes more skillful in the implementing of his purposes. There is no source perhaps today more available to us as a cause for hope than science. Not the science that we know. Not the science which is willing to dissect only matter and will try to break through the boundaries of material barriers that, that divide the various conditions of the pre-organic world. The real purpose of science is to demonstrate constantly the integrities in life, the integrities in atoms, the integrities of rule a cosmic system which unfolds under a tremendous pattern of values of integrities, of realities. Therefore, the search for value must open the way for the transmission of soul power. This soul power makes all things new. This soul power descending from its own source as the primary aspect of the eternal creating principle descends into matter and we may say, in matter, if we look about it, it dies for the sins of the world. It is destroyed by our own selfishness, it is imprisoned, it is betrayed, and it is denied. It is then crucified upon the cross of matter, representing the material world with its dimensions and its institutions. This force which has died for the good of all survives within the structures which it came to redeem. It is part now of the internal constitution of every living thing, not only human but in all the kingdoms of nature. This soul power in man is the promise of redemption. It tells us without any equivocation that the power to be right is within us that the power to build a proper world is inherent and that there will always be available to us an inner guidance if we move in the right direction. True happiness is the result of obedience to the demands of the soul within us. If we can begin to recognize this truth, we will have the victory of soul over circumstance. There is no way in which this can come about until the creatures that are formed become the leaders of this reformation. Man is the most complex organism in nature. Man as having the individual capacity and ability to think, to feel, to love, to hope, to have faith. Be these capacities within man. Make him the proper guardian of the planet. They make him the potential leader in the evolution of life from its most primitive to its most advanced form. We have to make use of these inner realizations in order to protect ourselves from the encroachment of circumstances. 
Now, we mostly accept that within ourselves is a life that is separate from the body. We realize or accept that there is a person in the body. But what we have not quite recognized yet is that there is a soul behind the person. The person to us is just an invisible counterpart of ourselves, as we are. The person in us is the thing or power that wants, desires, debates, discusses, argues, and fights. So that this person is really not a redeeming principle. It is merely an invisible likeness of ourselves, a psychological image of our own attainments and abilities. It is behind us, perhaps backed by the experiences of many embodiments, it has a certain integrity rooted within it. But even this part of the mind or of the person is neglected, even as the mental processes in the material world are neglected. Therefore, we must educate the person in the body by the development of our own character. If we get a character built to a certain point, we can do many things to improve our destiny. Much of the writings and philosophies of the Quakers and the Friends, uh, various group, small groups in European and now in American Christianity, have had experiences and wisdoms in this particular direction. Much of Quakerism and of the beliefs of the Friends and the Pietists of Pennsylvania much of their belief is based upon the mysticism of Jacob Berne, the German philosopher, mystic. His greatest interpreter, William Law, is now regarded as one of the leading lights of the, of the organization of friends. He has long departed, but his influence continues to dominate. It was Berne's intention, and through Law, this intention has become uh, more clearly defined, to realize that the only way that we can bring the soul out of man, can bring this inner life into manifestation, is through what they call quietism. Quietism is based upon a simple biblical statement, be still and know that I am God. Quietism, therefore, is the relaxation of the outer person and the recognition of the majesty of the divine principle within ourselves. There is no way in which we can achieve union with the inner self while the confusion of our physical relationships remain uncorrected, remains uncorrected. There has to be some receptivity the small voice must be heard because it is also the voice of infinite authority. This small voice uh, comes only to those in whose hearts and minds the love of God dominates all other considerations. The individual, therefore, enters into a prayerful state in which he accepts the will of heaven and seeks to do the purposes of the eternal life. Now we have two forms of prayer. One is a mystical form which is concerned with one concept only, not my will but thine be done. True prayer is not a constant begging for divine providence or intercession. True prayer is the glorification of the spiritual source within ourselves. We give thanks that within us is the power of our own redemption, and that in the world itself as a composite, within itself is the power of its own redemption. In a materialistic form of religion, we find the, the demands of the personal self too dominant. The individual prays for wealth, he prays for power, he prays for whatever he wants. But it is, as Pythagoras said, 
only the wise man who prays for what he needs. And the need that we have is the experience of the presence of God. Our need is to gradually become aware of the great mystical plan in which we exist, the plan which must unfold down through time, like the opening of the lotus or the blooming of the rose. This unfolding of soul power is the destiny for which we were appointed. Now it is obvious that whatever it is that could conceive this in the beginning, could bring cosmos out of chaos, could establish law to govern all things and love to govern law, that this power cannot be defeated by a, major, by a minor display of human stupidity. It cannot be defeated by man. Man can never change the divine plan because that plan is the source of himself. There is nothing about him that isn't part of that plan, and nothing happens to him but is part of the purpose of that plan. Therefore, the individual cannot reform the universe any more than King Canute could prevent the coming in of the tide of the sea. We are all involved in a pattern in which the only way to win is to obey. And the only way in which we can become aware of this obedience is by the cultivation of our own internal spiritual resources. This is the only answer. The answer comes from the inside. The problem comes from the outside. And there is no power in the world that can solve the inside problem by outside means. The uh, pietists and many other mystical groups, following in the example of the ancient mystery system, came to the conclusion that each individual must cross the bridge between his own personality and the divine archetype that lies within him. Man is a many-fold creature, of which only a small part is visible. The invisible part of man is much more splendid, much vaster in its potentials, more reliable in its testimonies, more inevitable in its ends. Therefore, this little part, this small end of a composite creature which we call a human being and the human body. This is forever existing within a mysterious age of energies, of mysterious spiritual invisible powers, moving, turning, constantly impelling and constantly nourishing. Part of the invisible does nourish the body. Part of the invisible does nourish the mind and the emotions. But that part which nourishes these things is moved by an eternal principle of truth. And therefore, the soul in itself is apart from its manifestations, but may not be recognized by us except through the projections of its own elements into the material constitutions of life. We are therefore living truly, wonderfully, within our own spiritual life. We are surrounded and ensouled by a power which in uh, Pilgrim's Progress is referred to as the armor of righteousness. This is in truth our eternal defense. It is the inside that must save the outside. And it is also the outside that must be brought into union with the internal before we can plan an enduring civilization. To find this other part is difficult now because we are completely controlled by luxury and appetite. Our idea of happiness is abundance. Not abundance of virtue, but abundance of worldly possessions or opportunities to do as we please. In this wonderful pattern of things, in which we, if we could only see all of ourselves, the spiritual as well as the material parts, we would be in awe. We would fall on our knees because we would be standing in the presence of that blazing bush 
which Moses saw, we would see God moving through the tremendous involvement of our structure, more wonderful, more beautiful, more strange to us than even the galaxies we are seeking to explore. And yet to find this, to be, really achieve this recognition, we must change patterns which prevent the possibility of the true discovery of life. We must realize, as we sit back quietly and nurse alcoholism, or become narcotics addicts, or live on barbiturates, that these things are not the way of life. We must realize that extravagance leading to intemperance is the way of gradual disintegration. Now it is true that that which lies behind this form will not disintegrate. It will be like a mysterious parent that has a wayward child. This inner parent principle, the soul, can look out and mourn over the delinquencies of the body which refuses to be aware of its presence. And as many a mother or father today are concerned over the intemperances of their children and yet are powerless to change them. So the soul in man is represented in ancient art as a weeping woman weeping over the sin of the world. This soul power is, however, eternal, inevitable. If by our own carelessness, our own destructiveness, we cast aside the works of this world, if we decrease the energies of our bodies, if we misuse the faculties of our minds, and if we abuse the mysteries of our emotions, we sicken. And we may very probably pass out of this life without ever having achieved the purpose for which we were born. Man was born not to die. He was not created merely to go through a, a short span of years and then vanish forever. Man was born to grow, and growth is unfoldment. It is ideation from within ourselves. We were grow born into this world to become better. And to the degree that we fail to accept the challenge of being better, we frustrate the purpose of our own existence. Under such conditions, if we have become so set in our ways that it is impossible for us to forgive our enemies, overcome our grievances, or master our appetites, nature in its infinite wisdom brings this material body to an end. We are actually released from conditions we cannot change because of habit. And what we call death is simply the individual shuffling off for a little while not just the body but all the habits, attitudes and policies which have denied the soul its proper manifestation in daily life. But if we can begin to develop the resources that are proper we will find that the enlightened soul blazing forth in its glory from within the depths of ourselves is a kind of star of Bethlehem. It announces the coming of salvation. It announces that the individual is growing to the point where the inner good can become manifest in the outer life. Now many people have tried, each in his own way, to accomplish some type of release of this inner good. For centuries, ascetics have denied themselves most of the material advantages of living in order to separate their consciousness from bondage to material things. Others have sought in various ways to express their inner convictions through art, through music, through all of the creative expressions, for all of the arts belong to the soul, just as surely as the skills belong to the mind. Art has always been a kind of symbolic instrument of release. It has given us pictures of things unseen. It has given us lessons in moral and character. It has made more beautiful our homes. Beautiful paintings have become windows on walls. Beautiful music 
brings us closer to the chanting of the cherubim. But all these things have also been reduced. Arts have been profaned. All these skills have been utterly commercialized. As a result, they gradually deteriorate in principle and in spirit. We have lost the validity of our art in many instances because of our own interpretation of the purpose of beauty. We have thought of it as a commodity when in reality it is a great necessity. To uh, look forward then into the things that are likely to happen in the appreciable future, we see a world that is in the throes of a mystical rebirth. We see the rise of a new asceticism. We behold the individual, first of all, turning against what he calls the establishment. Now, the establishment is simply a term. There is a little story about a schoolboy who came home with long hair. The parents didn't like it very well and asked him why he did it. And he said, because that is a way of badging a determination to resist the establishment. It is a proof I'm against the establishment. Well, the parent said, can't you prove it some other way? He said, certainly not, because if I don't do it this way, our establishment will not be able to go on. So he belonged to an establishment built upon long hair. As a, rebe as a rebellion against an establishment uh, built upon long dollars. The uh, problem just, just shifts its position, but is not solved. But against the establishment of corruption, we find not really a rebellion against civilization or society, but a rebellion against a restriction upon our right to grow, a situation that makes growth almost impossible for the average young person starting out today. He will face problems that the older generation has never known. He finds the world around him an enemy to that which he might dream of accomplishing if he had the opportunity. He does not want to sink back into the material slough of despond which is binding his ancestors. But actually, what we are saying is that there is gradually arising among us not really a revolt against establishment but a revolt against the fact that establishment as we know it is materialistic, atheistic, or agnostic at best. We are not any longer able to stand the pressure of mistakes. They are closing in upon us, threatening our civilization, and threatening the possibility of these young people growing up to establish firm and solid homes and raise families in their turn. Our way of life has got to grow because at the moment the crisis is partly due to the fact that we are outgrowing the way of life that we've been clinging to. We have become uh, aware that what we are doing is not correct, that our ambitious and ambitions and aspirations are not all legitimate, that we are in constant need of building a world around us that will represent the world within us. And to do this, we must gradually restore what the ancients called the Golden Age as our first line of defense against the age of gold. This realization uh, means that we are growing. It is a good sign. There will be mistakes. Many of these young people will get into desperate troubles because they have no guidances they have no foundations upon which to build. But one thing is evident. Many of these younger people are desirous of a better way of life than they have ever known. Being in inexperience, having little if anything to guide them, they are making very many mistakes. 
they're getting into serious difficulties, not because they want to, but because to them uh, the resistance program is simply against conditions rather than being a challenge to the unfoldment of internal resources. Not long ago, Chinese and the Mao made what was called the Great Cultural Revolution. This revolution was called by Mao the Great Leap into the Future. It was a disaster. And as we find from our press today, China is gradually trying to recover from the Great Leap into the Future. Why? because that great leap had as its fundamental principle absolute materialism. It was to be a leap into, uh, into industrial success, a leap into wealth, power, world control. It was a leap into a condition in which the rules of Karl Marx were to take the place of the laws of Confucius. But it was a disaster. Mao should have consulted uh, the E. King and not Das Kapital. He was not able to solidify and unify. He did a great deal of good. He would have done much more if he had not attempted to destroy the way of his own people. Now it is being restored. The prophets of China are coming back into estimation because there is no remedy for world conditions except the restoration of religiously oriented idealism. Even Napoleon, who was not what might be termed especially devout, said that there was no nation can be ruled without religion. No nation can be governed without religion. No nation can grow without religion. This must be the link, the only link that we generally recognize between the material and the spiritual. It is the one power which causes us or strengthens us to suffer for principles. It is the only power that we know that can cause us to renounce temporal advantages in order to achieve the salvation of the species. So we have this realization that coming up today, our young people, who when experience strengthens and deepens their lives, may accomplish what we have failed to accomplish, namely the restoration of an internal life, the recognition that we must have faith in the infinite or the finite will fail. So it is with each of us now, regardless of our years. In the terms of the universe, we may all be considered very, very old, and we can also be considered merely emerging from infancy. It depends upon the perspective. One thing is certain, we all need a lot more growth. We all need a lot more insight into the realities and purposes of our own existence. The, the rising tide of religion will increase. There is no doubt in the world that every day of emergency is causing many people to think for the first time in their lives. And their thoughts will not be entirely upon the society around them because there is nothing to be found there that solves anything for them. This thoughtfulness will turn gradually to the correction of causes. It will point out the endless tragedy of discords. It will tell us that no matter who wins the revolution, there will be another revolution. The only answer for the thoughtful person is to find solution. And he can only find solution by discovering the fact of the necessity of obeying the universal archetype. We must live as we were intended to live or suffer. Millions of people are coming to this conclusion. More will as time goes on. Each of us will have to come in fullness of time to the realization that we are here to obey and flourish 
under a great dispensation of benevolence. We are here because of the endless benevolence of deity. We are here because the creating power, in its own inevitable manner, determined the salvation of all that lives, and then prepared the mechanism which made this salvation inevitable. This uh, inevitability of the way of salvation is a, dis a disappointment to a great many people who really do not want to be saved. They would prefer to follow the materialistic point of view that when they are dead, they are very dead, and that's the end of it. Materialism, therefore, uh, not only is ina inadequate, but it gives the individual an, a non-valid excuse for remaining as he is. It remains for him, therefore, to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow he is dead. But what we realize is that when we eat, drink, and be merry, we only get rid of the body, but we are still alive to face the consequences of our own actions. Most people are not oriented to this concept, however. Having come to a realization that we are here to survive, we then can approach the whole problem of life with a greater optimism. We are becoming a world of neurotics, frightened, disappointed, and disillusioned. But what we are really being disillusioned in is our own mistakes. We are existing in the proof and consequences that we didn't do it right. Now this is an important discovery because it can lead us to realize that we must find out what is right and stay with it. This is all part, therefore, of cosmic growing pains. We are like children who, coming up through adolescence, develop all kinds of ailments, from acne to uh, neurotics. Uh, while they are trying to work with this body, they suffer from the measles, the mumps, and all kinds of ailments. They also suffer from the awkwardness of their own unadjusted psychological structure. They are in the process of gradually growing up. At any point along the way, it might be a disappointing situation. There are many uh, children that do not look as though they will ever grow up, but most of them do. And the problem child of today is the good citizen of tomorrow. The problem humanity of today is the cooperative commonwealth of tomorrow. We are simply growing. And growing is not a source for discontent or despair. If we were able to continue in our mistakes forever, then there would be cause for despair. If the problems that face us now were going to be our problems till the end of eternity, who would want to live? Actually, however, change comes in. And in nature, when men disobey and get punished for their disobediences, the change is gradually but inevitably for the better. We are slow of learning, however. We cling desperately to the attitudes that we have long held and simply refuse, if we can avoid the uh, challenge, to change our ways. Therefore, instead of worrying about this problem, instead of getting all unhappy about the terrors of the times, let us realize that they are part of a plan in which there is neither death nor destruction. As the Bhagavad Gita so beautifully points out, the great war of the world is not the end. The great war of the world is a constant testing by which we divide weakness from strength and gradually strengthen that which is weak. There is no death but only a change of worlds. There is no end of anything but, but ultimate perfection. And it is that ultimate perfection which we want to cooperate with in every way possible. We want to do our share in leading the world from its immaturity to a condition of true integration, true security, true maturity. If we will change our point of view, we can do it a little bit or help ourselves by two concepts. 
which may be useful to us. The first is faith. Without faith, works are impossible. Without faith, nothing can grow. Without faith, we are constantly living in an insecurity. Faith tells us that there is hope. Faith tells us there is purpose. Faith tells us that all of our weaknesses will ultimately be brought into enlightenment. Faith tells us there is a reason for what is happening to us, that that reason is good, and that if our faith is great enough, we can face the emergency without fear or despair. Therefore, faith is probably one of the strongest forces in our lives today. The second great power that we need uh, to understand these principles is the willingness to accept. We must find in faith the strength necessary for the acceptance, acceptance of things as they are. Faith must show us that we must suffer things to be so now because we have caused them. Faith coming along with the recognition of the need and the desperate purpose of the plan in which we live makes a great difference in our point of view. Faith creates acceptance. Uh, acceptance studied and meditated upon by the mind and the heart strengthens faith the redemption of the world begins with a single step. The first step the individual takes in trying to grow must be taken on faith alone. He steps into an unknown world of causes, leaving behind him a smug little world of contentions and discords. The first step toward reality must be inspired by faith. It must be strengthened and skilled by the acceptances of those situations which are necessary to growth. If then we start in with faith and we are willing to assume that what is happening is the greater good, that out of all emergencies come greatness and wonder. Out of the dark earth comes the flower. Out of the mistakes we have made comes the fulfillment of our destiny. Therefore, we must have this faith stronger than fretting, fearing, and doubting. We must try to look out upon life and become aware of the good that is there. To be able to estimate that which is real is more important than to fall under the hypnosis of that which is unreal. Everywhere if we look with faith, we will find grounds for faith. If we look with fear, we will find grounds for fear. If we look and study with acceptances, we will find that these things accept things of value. If we do not accept and reject that which is next, we lock ourselves further into our own disaster. So people who are wandering around now trying to find a place to go where they'll survive an earthquake, worried to death about their stocks and bonds, miserable over the conflict in their families, and overly concerned with the conflicts of nations, these persons must recognize that their foundation that is enduring will be that to see through all of these disasters a purpose a purpose that must be fulfilled, a purpose that must be met, and that actually to have our attention focused upon these needs is the greatest good that can happen to us, much more valuable than sitting quietly and watching some impossible television performance. We, uh, we can accept what we do not like, discipline. The discipline of the infinite over the finite. The, dif the, de uh, the defense of principles which is forever interfering with our pleasures and our luxuries. 
But if we can really begin to see the plan, fear will go. There is nothing to be afraid of in this world. The only things that we should be regretting are the things we do badly. We have sometimes good cause for regret, but no cause for terror. We may feel the insecurity of our material situation means the end of us, but in reality it means the beginning of us. When we never know of truly how much we are worth until we lose most of what we have. Then we measure the person by what he is. And he never was to be measured by any other rule. Any other estimation of him is fallacy. The individual is what he is and must be measured on that. And not by his worldly goods, his public office, or his private uh, influence. So when we begin to think in this way, we don't have to be so worried anymore. We will be where we ought to be. We will come when we are supposed to and go when we're supposed to. Not because of fatal necessity. Not because there is some despotism that is controlling these things. But rather that in the passing, in the path of growth, we come and go as growth requires. And after all, the end is the important thing. Ultimately, we must live in, with ourselves in the great eternity which we call life. And to prepare for this is far more important than any other task we can undertake. So let's think in terms now of not worrying, not fearing. We may have the deepest sympathy for affliction. We may have the deepest realization that conditions are not right. We may regret all of the fallacies and falsenesses which are surrounding us. But we must also realize that they are part of a divine handwriting on the wall. That they are telling us what we must learn. And because we have not been very good students, we are forced to learn the hard way. That is what it really amounts to. But learn we will. There is no way in which the human being can ultimately escape his own perfection. He wishes it was closer, and he would like it to bring more worldly opportunities. This cannot be guaranteed. But it will be the purpose for which he was fashioned in the beginning, the reason why the spark of his own soul was cast off of the wheels of space. It was created for a destiny. And its destiny must be as great as the power that fashioned it. We therefore do not need to be insecure. All we need to do is to make every possible effort to rectify our own conduct, to live in the light of inner understanding, to share it with those who wish it, to set the example of what is best by living it ourselves, and then with a gentle, quiet faith, except what heaven bestows. This was the beginning of Chinese philosophy. Heaven bestows, man receives. Therefore, the superior governs the inferior to the end. The superior is infinite good. Therefore, evil cannot prevail. In the next few years, we may have some difficult times. We may find reverses that will hurt us, but we will also probably find that out of the common problem will come the recognition of the common need. I remember not too long ago uh, being involved in a problem involving a local disaster. A number of families that had previously lived together uh, were subject to what appeared to be an act of providence. Uh, their homes were destroyed, their lives were threatened, some passed on. It was a very serious episode. But within 24 hours, humanity moved in. People they had never spoken to came with help. Those who were near and distant were solicitous. They opened their homes to the homeless. They fed the hungry. 
not because of law, but because it was their own natural human instinct. And whenever disaster strikes, the human instinct is to help. When a world disaster becomes sufficiently acute, the world instinct will be to solve and to help. And those who had never known each other in prosperity became friends for life as a result of adversity. This is only a symbol, but it points to something. It points to the fact that in our troubles we come together. And the ultimate purpose of life is that we shall come together. In our prosperities we go our own way. We do not know those close to us. But when trouble comes, humanity rallies to it. And from all over the world, help comes when need arises. This is the situation when the world's problem reaches the condition in which it touches us in the heart instead of in the pocketbook, we will begin to see differently. And out of the misfortunes and tragedies of the moment comes the union of all that lives in one great fraternity of cooperation. We must find that it is necessary. We must also realize that through helping those in need, serving those in trouble, bringing peace to those in pain, we suddenly find a new relationship, a relationship that is not of blood, perhaps not even of, the, of a previous friendship, but a relationship of man's natural desire, inevitable soul-seeking within himself to bring help to those in need. The world is in need today. And as this, this, this need grows greater, human beings will more and more forget their own little selfishness and unite to ease the pains of the world. Thus the will of heaven is fulfilled upon earth. Thus the eternal shows its victory over the temporal. And thus the soul, which is forever solicitous, gains d dominion over the mind, which is so often self-centered. So in these changes that come, be of good cheer. Do not become fearful. Remember that the promise of the messianic dispensation remains, that we were created to be eternally enlightened, and that there has descended into us, in this symbolic meaning, the great soul of life, the only begotten of the Father, and that this soul moving within us is the secret of our salvation and that nothing can prevent that soul from its ultimate victory over the self-centeredness of the human being. We can help to make that victory a little quicker. We can help to bring more of that soul out of ourselves through our conduct, our dedications, and our human instincts. It will come, and when that time does come, we will then have the, the celebration of the sunrise of a new world, a new age, a new way of life, a way of life in which we live in rather simple relationship with each other, not in material luxuries, but no, not in poverty, in poverty, not in having all we want, but wanting only that which is best. And... Uh, each of us, regardless of the day, this day, any other day, all days, can go on fully convinced and perfectly secure in the, re re in the realization that that which is our own will come to us, and the soul within us, in its victory over the ignorance or perversity of the outer world, can bring us in the end to that which is promised, that those who believe in reality, believe in truth, believe in the power of salvation from within ourselves, though they pass through great tragedy, will come to the great realization, the great fulfillment, and will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This type of thinking is, I think, appropriate. So do not continue to fear. Have a natural faith in the law have love and fraternity for each other in all of your problems, and accept in the spirit of childhood, accepting the wisdom of a great parent, the lessons of life with peace, understanding, 
and not only respect, but admiration. If we can achieve this type of thinking, we can meet the future without fear. Well, friends, that's the morning. I'd like to make a couple of announcements at this point.